That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Funny Pages, the directorial debut of Owen Klein, which premiered at the 2022 uh, Cannes Film Festival in the director's Fortnite section. And A24 is releasing it August 26, 2022. I thought this movie was excellent. Same. It was actually my top ten favorites at Cannes, and uh, it was a joy to re-watch as well. I would watch it again. Mm -hmm. The director... Owen Klein is the progeny of Academy Award winner Kevin Klein and Phoebe Cates. Um, what did he win an Oscar for? A Fish Called Wanda. Oh. 1987? Somewhere in there. Uh... Owen Klein previously uh, was featured uh, as a child in uh, Noah Baumbach's The Squid and the Whale. Uh, he's also worked uh, as a crew member on several uh, Safdie Brothers films and has directed a couple shorts of his own. This feature was produced by the Safdie Brothers and it very much feels like uh, part of that realm, which uh, like early Safdie features, which I really enjoy. It's like a weird, uncomfortable slightly disturbing story which i like mm -hmm. a word you used to describe it after the screening that i liked a lot was singular okay I'm not sure what i meant by that now that i now that you say that but <laughs> well we could talk about it yeah it, it feels uh i i think what i meant by that was it's a weird little story with characters that we don't get to know very very well but the film ends like the story ends with me feeling very satisfied with what i just saw mm -hmm. So I think that's what I meant. I think that the character work in this is really well done because while it's so sp this set in such a specific world with people that are very much obsessed with a certain thing, uh, we get a, a sense of who they are immediately from the information that we get about them. These feel like well-worn, uh, relatable, <laughs> kind of dysfunctional people. Anyway, the basic story is it revolves around a young man named Robert. Mm -hmm. Played by Daniel Zolg Hadri of Bo Burnham's eighth grade. He's 17. He's in high school. He's really into like comic books and like drawing comics. Mm -hmm. The opening of the film is him with his teacher, this big fat man, Mr. Katano. And that's important because he. He, he is talking to his teacher about applying to art school, and the teacher is like, telling giving him terrible advice like don't follow the instructions of the uh, like admissions department of the colleges on how to submit your portfolio do what you want to do and robert has enough sense to think like maybe i should just do what they asked me to do which includes drawing figurines mm -hmm. which is like sketching like bodies i think mm -hmm. so finally his teacher goes fine you can sketch me and this big ass man hops on the his desk takes off all of his clothes, mm -hmm. gets naked, mm -hmm. and Robert starts sketching him. And it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Like this grown-ass man <laughs> is naked in front of this young boy. But Robert's going with it, and he doesn't seem bothered, but then his alarm, the alarm on his cell phone goes off. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I have to go, I have to go to work. So he walks. And then we see that his teacher pulls up next to him as he's walking driving in his car saying like hey i'm really worried that you thought what i did was weird i don't want it to be weird i'm just trying to help you you know i love you um you know let me drive you to work no no i like walking to work it's only five minute walk okay well you're making it more weird because you won't get in my car and as they're going back and forth the teacher gets hit head on by another car and dies and dies and that's before the opening credits i think mm -hmm. and then during the credits we're, then we're at the funeral mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll get to this in a second, but it's at that point, like where we see that Robert sort of has a new lease on life as a 17 year old. He wants to drop out of high school, move out of his parents' house and may not even want to go to art school because he just wants to hit the ground running. I should finish the story. He, along with his best friend, Miles, mm -hmm. who's played by uh, Miles Manuel. They break into his dead teacher's house to retrieve some of his artwork. Office. Oh, office. At I'm school. Sorry. No, they're in a house. No, they're at school. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. They break into a building to steal their artwork and they get caught by the police. Mm -hmm. Well, only Robert gets caught. Miles runs away. So now Robert's in trouble. He's in court. His public defender is a woman named Cheryl. She mm -hmm. gets him off from charges. <laughs> and then... 
he explains to her, like, I need a job because he works at a comic book store, but he needs more money because he wants to move out and do things on his own. So he starts working for her. So a couple of important things happen. He finds, he lives in New Jersey, in Princeton, New Jersey. He finds an apartment in Trenton, which I'm not familiar with this area, but we're told it's not a nice area. Mm -hmm. He moves, we need, the, the apartment he moves into needs its own movie, but we'll save it for a minute. Mm -hmm. He moves into this shitty apartment and he starts working for Cheryl. He, she's the public defender. He's writing notes for her as she's meeting with clients. And it's a, and the most important client is a guy named Wallace, mm -hmm. who's played by Matthew Marr from uh, he's in Marriage Story and uh, he's in a ton of stuff. Uh, you've seen him in things. He's so very good. Our in this flag movie. means death. He's quite good in. He he's in trouble because he caused a scene at a Rite Aid, <laughs> which is just funny thinking about. But during one of the sessions where Robert is taking notes while my, Wallace is talking. It's revealed that Wallace used to work for like a popular comic book printing company, I think. Mm -hmm. And Robert's all ears. Uh, but as it's notable that he was uh, an assistant to the colorist. so he's He a was color a color separator. separator. He wasn't an artist. Mm -hmm. But Robert is obsessed with him. Sort of becomes attached to him, which culminates in Robert offering Wallace $300 to like mentor him, like show him how to draw. And Robert who has now moved out of his parents' house, thinks it would be a good idea to bring this grown-ass man with active criminal charges, who clearly has mental health issues, to bring him to his parents' house on Christmas. Mm -hmm. In Princeton. And this is the end of the film where shit goes left because it's super awkward for a variety of reasons that are probably pretty obvious. And it ends with Miles, Robert's best friend, comes over, who's also super into comic books. And they get into an, a conversation because Wallace is showing Robert how to draw. And Robert and Miles are being kind of obnoxious. And it leads to them fighting over some sort of pen. Like the kind of pen you, one would dip into ink. Mm -hmm. So it's sharp at the end like a shiv. They're arguing over this pen. One thing leads to another. And Miles, Robert's best friend, gets stabbed in the head. Mm -hmm. Like a damn horror movie. Mm-hmm. Wallace runs away from the house. Robert, Robert chases him. Wallace whoops Robert's ass. Robert, like, who's been beaten up, wearing, like... His pajamas. Like, literally, like, long john undies, <laughs> goes to the comic book store, opens the store at the end. Mm -hmm. This shit was wild, funny. Um, it's silly and uncomfortable at the same time, but I left the movie wanting to talk about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Even... Specifically, his parents, which we didn't even talk about, who are played by Josh Pace and uh, Maria Dizia. But yeah, there's so much to talk and about. And then Ron Rifkin plays the grandfather, who's only in one scene. Yeah, um, but there's just so much I liked about this movie. Um, I said I would get back to this. Uh, I thought this movie felt like an actual comic book mm -hmm. because of all these ugly ass people they cast. I thought the casting was perfect. It feels like an underground kind of comic, especially because it's also very. There's like a sleazy element to it, and it's very adult uh, and and uh, uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, everyone has a very distinct look. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Much like um, Fellini, uh, like a Fellini film or a couple Woody Allen movies I can think of. I liked all of the characters. To start, the public defender Cheryl, who mm -hmm. plays her. Uh, Marsha DeBonis, who is in Orange is the New Black. There's a couple Orange is the New Black alums in here, including yes. um, Constance Schulman as one of uh, Kitano's colleagues she's so sweet because she's like she cares about her clients and she she's just a very sweet lady and then of course agrees to help robert but the first time the first when he goes in to meet with her like after his court trial and he's telling her like i need help i need work she goes ooh, ooh, ooh. oh because robert drew a picture of her like mm -hmm. a caricature and she thought it, it just tickled her pink mm -hmm. so she, as soon as robert comes to her office she's like "Ooh, i'm gonna call my co-worker in here you need to draw him real fast while he's standing and there. don't be afraid to be mean <laughs> and yeah and, and fuck it up mm -hmm. and i thought that was such a good scene because she's bullshitting with her co-worker who looks crazy as hell trying to keep him long enough so robert can get a good look at him mm -hmm. and then robert keeps looking at him while he's drawing i thought the way it was shot was so cute mm -hmm. that was a really good scene um okay 
even before that, when Robert's in court, of course, his parents come down and they're all worried like, oh my God, oh my God. And they bring a family friend who's an attorney. Mm -hmm. And Robert tells his parents, I'd actually prefer Cheryl represent me. She already knows my case and I feel good about it. And she does and gets him off. So then after the trial, they go have breakfast. Hearing. Like mom, dad, or the hearing, sorry. Mom, dad, and Robert. And the dad, it's obvious that the dad has problems with his son. He's disappointed that he's not more of a go-getter and is not more focused. And then things get bad because Robert tells his parents he wants to drop out of high school, get his GED, and maybe not go to college. But the dad says, I want you to write a letter to our friend, the lawyer, because, you know, he's very busy, very important, and he took the morning off to help you. And Robert says, I didn't ask for his help. You did. So maybe you should apologize maybe to him. Maybe you should get him a fruit basket. That took me out. Mm -hmm. I thought for some reason that was so funny Well, to me. it's <laughs> just like, oh, and he's so disrespectful to his parents. And they aren't not, they're not not loving, but it's clear that they fostered an environment where he's willing to live in the cesspool right. of degradation in order to get away from them. Well, that's such a good topic because it question, yeah, it's like, it makes me question their parenting because your child, which we'll talk about this apartment, your child is willing to work two jobs, drop out of school and live in a fucking dump just to not be in your very nice middle-class house. Mm -hmm. What is going on in there? I mean, that was kind of my childhood. But, uh, <laughs> But it, it, but as we, you know, I think Robert is initially sympathetic, and then as it comes to find, he's he's a spoiled brat. He's a dick. Well, and then I really like the development of his character because initially we think, oh, he's a sweet guy who's just like, you know, he wants to follow his dreams. But then it becomes clear that he is a brat. Mm -hmm. So I thought the way that character was developed over the course of the film was very effective. Well, because 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 it creeps up on you. The underlying effects. The, or the subtext is about form versus soul. Uh, and I think Miles has a very direct statement about that in the uh, right before the melee in the third act is like, can you discount uh, soul for form or vice versa? And coming to realize that you kind of like, an, like all things in life need a, a balance of both. But Robert has been consumed in all the wrong ways by perfecting a sort of form, but without maybe really having anything to say. To say and and depending on kind of bad advice from two different people because this is all the film is really all about him trying to replace that mentorship that he had with Katano and and blindly throwing himself at Wallace who is not equipped to be that for him. So, Robert works at the comic book store. The owner of the comic book store um, finds out Robert's plans and Robert's saying, "I need a car so I can get around." And the owner of the store is like, "Well, you can have La Cucaracha." You're, you're more than welcome to take her. I don't know if she runs, but you can have her. And it turns out to be like a 1998 Nissan Altima. And gets, the shit is raggedy. When he gives him the keys, he said, now it's your problem. Yeah, so you know it's bad. And the car is raggedy. It, and it does eventually break down. But, but he's so happy. I remember that age and just being like, you know, just yeah. a sense of freedom. He's so happy to take Well, he's it. happy. And the first time he drives it, there's a song playing that is like, uh-oh, uh-oh. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was really funny. And when he's getting gas and smoking and some guy at the gas station is like, your car's smoking. And he's like, thanks. Thank you. Like, no, bitch, your shit is about to explode. <laughs> then there's another song. Well, we can get into... Well, actually, let's move to the apartment. He goes to look at this apartment, and it's a man named Barry. Played by Michael Townsend Wright. Oh, he was so perfect. He's yes. this creepy-ass, middle-aged, greasy-looking man mm -hmm. with a, the comb-over from hell. And it's a basement apartment, and he's showing him around. And wh whoever wrote this did such Owen, Owen Klein. He did such a good job because it's not like overtly comical, but these lines are just perfect. Barry's creepy as hell. This apartment is dank. There are no windows. The boiler is on. They're in the boiler room. Everyone is sweaty as hell. And then it's poor Robert's looking at this apartment. He. You know when you're young and you just want to be on your own, like yeah. anything's acceptable. So he is bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll, I'll, I don't give a damn where I sleep. There is an aquarium that is big and green, like full of whatever. LG in the kitchen. He, in the kitchen. And then at one point we see this black man just in this apartment, like, okay. So then, and then at another point, Barry excuses himself, like to go into his room. And he just says like, yeah, goodbye for a moment. Like goodbye for a moment. And he's in there for a while. He comes out and he's like, okay, well, I only have one rule. 
no one can know you're living here. So we already know this is a bullshit. Oh, and he has to be back by midnight. And he has to be back at the house at midnight because they lock up the door. So, so Barry asks Robert, do you have any questions? And he's like, well, it's kind of hot in here. Uh, Like, it's really hot in here. And then also, where am I going to be sleeping? And he says, well, we haven't figured that out yet. Or something. We have an extra bed. We have an extra bed in this room. And Robert's like, oh, with that guy? Oh, yeah. Steven, I think. Steven. Oh, so, oh, so Steven's moving out. And Barry's like, no. <laughs> He's like, oh, so I'll get half a room. He's like, I don't know. It's not up to me. It's not up to me. I thought that shit was so perfect. It's so funny. It's like a nightmare. It is a there nightmare. There really could be a movie about that. Oh, because then apartment. he takes a shower there. Oh. Child, this poor boy takes a shower in this raggedy ass apartment and the water is coming out so damn brown that it, like his skin looks brown. I think there are three scenes set in that apartment and all of them are brilliant. <laughs> they are. And then there's a point where Robert comes home and there's another song playing that the person saying like Pussyfoot, Pussyfoot. It sounds like it's from an old cartoon. Like a Betty Boop type thing. Mm-hmm. And he and he can't sleep. Because it's so loud. So he knocks on Barry's door. And he walks in there. And Barry and Steven are like masturbating in this hot ass. It's just a nightmare. But it lo- it looks, they kind of look before like they were on some kind of drugs. They seem Maybe like they're meth. on drugs. Yeah. It's a creepy scene, but it's so effective. Um, speaking of Barry, uh, there's a scene when Miles comes over. And it's established in this scene that maybe Miles is gay mm-hmm. because Barry's watching an old movie mm-hmm. and Barry and Miles comments like the actor's handsome. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> Barry explains like, oh, I have a friend who puts movies on DVDs for me in exchange for things. Like, Oh, what? and they are all cramped on Barry's bed <laughs> oh. and it, they're all hot and sweaty and <laughs> drinking looks like warm red wine. <laughs> Oh, like like watered down Lambrusco, like oh, so gross. <laughs> well, it seemed kind of bubbly. Um, again, these the casting is so good. There's a patron of the comic book store who appears to be like gender non-conforming. I don't know. I thought that character was so fun. Always in the way, yep. just in the way. Okay, we need to talk about Wallace because Wallace is a big part of this movie. Mm-hmm. His character has like anger management issues, maybe like borderline personality disorder. He is off the wall. Mm-hmm. He like gets mad in an instant. But at one point he tricks Robert into taking him home. But really, he doesn't want to go home. He wants to go to the pharmacy where he got arrested and he wants Robert to agitate the pharmacist so they can get it on camera. That is the pharmacist's fault. He wants to provoke him into he a rage. To, exactly. And I thought that scene was so good because poor Robert is creeping around this pharmacy like it's like... It's Christmas time, so there's like some kind of Christmas music and it looks kind of sad in there. And he, and Wallace keeps talking about the pharmacist. And so, of course, we're waiting to see the pharmacist and it does not disappoint. That man looked like if the Crypt Keeper dyed his hair black... <laughs> It was, no, it was his roots were uh, well, right? Yeah, like yeah. But no, but then there's a kind of a, a brilliant cameo from Louise Lasser, this woman in a wheelchair, which is and Louise Lasser was from Mary Hartman. Mary Hartman, she uh, was in a lot of Woody Allen's early films, particularly Bananas, and she was really good at playing affected women. She's in Requiem for a Dream. She's in Frankenhooker. Uh, it's very disturbing, and I've yeah. seen this twice because she's got tears streaming down her face but what she's saying is really funny begging for a Percocet (laughs) yeah she's crying but being weird and then yeah ultimately just wanting Percocet because Wallace tells Robert tell them that you're a junior pharmacist (laughs) and that'll get you closer to the pharmacist that wants to interview (laughs) but and and Robert's very articulate and he's a smart kid so he he kind of gets through it but but she's she's asked for Percocet and he's like I can't do that i'm a junior pharmacist i don't have any laws or rights to dispense medicine she goes what the fuck is that why are you here then (laughs) then it's taking robert a long time to get the job done so wallace busts into the pharmacy but he has like a restraining order so he's like hiding himself and he's telling robert like come on so robert picks up this big plastic horse and throws it at the pharmacist that shit was funny so wallace goes to Robert's parents' house for Christmas and it's so awkward because Wallace looks like uh, maybe he's in his 40s mm-hmm. um, and he looks kind of deranged. Well, 
Mm-hmm. He, they asked him to take his shoes off, and he wasn't prepared for that. So he has like these stinky ass feet with holes in his socks. And then, of course, the parents are like, "This is some bullshit. Why is my seventeen-year-old hanging out with this forty-year-old crazy person?" And they're interrogating Wallace because it's, it becomes clear that Robert met him at the courthouse. Mm-hmm. So Wallace gets freaks out and goes into the bathroom to avoid conversation. And when we finally catch Wallace in the bathroom, this fool is scrubbing his feet in the shower. It is so random. I thought that shit was so funny. <laughs> and then has a freak out and breaks the window in the bathroom because he can't breathe. And the parents, the dad is upset, but doesn't I'll... doesn't really do anything. Because I would have been like, uh, I'm calling the police. You have to get out of my house. Clearly doesn't know how to discipline his son. Right. Which is also, it's you know explains robert's behavior right uh and then that's when the getting stabbed in the head thing happens my only other note about funny scenes is there that green aquarium like that algae ridden aquarium there's a great shot and it's edited at just the right moment where robert is kind of freaked out because he witnesses the masturbating and he kind of like runs by the aquarium and like kneels down to grab his stuff and then whatever's in the aquarium some sort of Amphibious Amphibious creature. Yeah, like just jumps out at the perfect time. It's just so well done. At first, because at first he's like, I don't see anything. The first time he's in the apartment, he's like, I don't see anything in this aquarium. He's like, Was there any fish in there? He's like, Well, the one fish. Barry goes, It was eaten. He's like, Well, what happened to the fish that ate it? He goes, I don't know. Oh my gosh, so good. Uh, It was shot by Sean Price Williams, uh, who uh, lends heaven knows what for the Safdie brothers, which really uh, has a very similar vibe to this film. Um, And uh, and heaven knows what in particular, I think, owes a lot to Jerry Schatzberg's Panic in Needle Park. And this feels very, kind of has that energy of 70s era cinema. Uh, You know, Schatzberg does come to mind again, uh, and uh, maybe even John Cassavetes uh, a little bit as well. So I would give this movie four out of five. The reason I wouldn't give it five is there is something missing for me. The thing that's missing, I I don't think anything's wrong with this film. Um, And I really, really enjoyed it. But one thing we didn't mention, I think, is that the comics that Robert is drawing are very sexually explicit. Mm -hmm. Like Kama Sutra on crack. And I think, I feel like I need at least one scene where we better understand Robert's sexuality and not so much like whether he's gay or not, but just like, how does he know about these very graphic things? Because Miles, his best friend, it's sort of established that he might be gay because he talk, he says one actor's handsome and then there's a scene where he's caressing Robert. But but then his comic book drawings are very juvenile. Like there's a point made that they are sort of juvenile. But Robert... He's so sweet and articulate and thoughtful, kind of a dick in the end, but he's a kid. I think I needed to understand, like, he's drawing shit that's like, how do you even know what this is? Well, and there's a difference between how, like, uh, from what we learned, how Katano kind of dealt with both of these kids that he both was trying to foster their talents. But there's this unsaid energy about these titillating pictures, such as between Katano and Robert in the beginning. It's like, you are looking at... Porn. Porn. With this kid. Animated porn with this child. Yeah. Uh, which is... And he knows that there's something that's, you know, probably inappropriate about if that. If the film dealt with that a little bit more. I mean, I don't want to witness, well, you just, know, pedophilia and no, all that. No, no, no. But, 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 you know, just something that explained, like, how this came to be that Robert is comfortable with this inappropriate behavior. Well, it'd by, be a perfect film. Well, and by extension, this whole world of these people that are into this, you know, kind of... Uh, specific thing where there's fetishized, highly sexualized images and and what that means about them and maybe how they aren't able to get those needs met personally so that energy gets poured into this kind of creative outlet that creates, you know, all kinds of bizarre things or interesting things. Um, I I wanted to say it also reminded me of this film from 2019 called Give Me Liberty by Kirill uh, Mikhanovsky, which very much has a similar zany energy about this uh, group of Russians in New York. Uh, But yes, I I do think that, but I think it's on purpose that Robert's still kind of somewhat of a a blank slate as well. He's still figuring himself out. Um, Sure. I would give it four out of five as well. Yeah, check it out. Um, If you like weird, uncomfortable, funny things. Mm -hmm. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.